right behind you, there's a high free but safe inside. I climb and bring mercy to the man for me. Pardon how you wear me, my single soul shall free. No more to face me everywhere on my stormy sea. Giving my love, God, I love that will be made. I learned that much and more. I have to say it Good morning, everybody. technical stuff this morning so hopefully everything's clicking like we think it should be and um anyhow we want to welcome is it is it, is it live that's what i was is it live perfect that's what i had right all right welcome to high country cowboy church if you're here for the first time we want to extend a hand of welcome uh, this church is amazing and each week we just keep growing and growing and growing but i can see from daylight savings time there's some We'll show up in about an hour. <laughs> but that's okay. We're glad that you're here. Hey, a couple of quick announcements this morning before we begin. In High Country, High Country Cowboy Church, we do not pass a plate. We just fail in cowboy ministry. That's something that we do a bit different. If you want to give, there's a, a cream can over there on the table, and that's where you can give your tithes, your offerings. And uh, we much appreciate it. A few things coming up. You've seen this week, uh, Karen got the poster up and running for the cowgirl up. And so it's going to be an amazing event, amazing event. We also, we also, there work now, I think that, that particular um, uh, poster is at the printer. Our graphic designer is now working on the poster for the cowboy gathering. It's in your bolt on the dates. Uh, the Cowboy Gathering is going to be amazing. And then we have Michael Knight coming and Chris Golden coming to give to both do outdoor concerts this summer. And we need to keep in the front of our prayer our revival that's going to take place in July. That revival in July is going to be amazing. We're going to turn this valley upside down for Jesus Christ. And it's going to take all of us and we're really excited about that. And so we want to keep that in our prayer as we move forward um, uh, for that event. Now let me just share, you, share with you just uh, uh, some really awesome things that happened this week. This last Wednesday, on Wednesday night it starts at 6.30, we have round eight Bible study at, at our house. I want to encourage everybody to come. Last week was probably one of the best studies we've had. And it was really good. Everybody has, has said that they just really enjoyed it. And it was really good. Open, open their, their hearts and eyes and helped everybody to see more clearly some things that we were talking about. In our discussion, baptism was brought up. And our sister, Shelly Boggs, was in the back. And she nudged, she nudged, she nudged uh, Bud and said, I need to know more about that. And so when Bible study was over, Shelly and oh, actually Bud opened some scripture for her right then, but after Bible study was over, we shared some more scripture from her with her. And Shelly said, I need to be baptized. I said, Yes, ma'am, you do. And she said, Oh, I need to be baptized right now. Yes, I do. And so it was like 9.30 at night or 9 o'clock at night. And uh, I said, well, the creek's got ice on it, but we can bust the ice out of the creek. The horse drops in the backyard, we can fill it back up. And I looked over to GT and said, GT. I said, you still got that hot tub? He says, yes, I do. I said, is it full of water? He says, yes, it is. And so we all caravaned in the middle of the night to Lisa and GT's home. And with the moonlight to the Jacuzzi Jets, we baptized Shelly into Christ. It was an amazing week. I think it was about 12.30 at night when I got home that night. And some of you uh, got to watch it live stream and some of you got to be there in person. But 
Man, we're excited about Shelly's commitment. We're excited about all of all of you, your commitments. And you know, this church has helped a lot of people, and it continues to help a lot of people as lives are changed. But I want you to know this: the closer we get to the cross, that's right. The closer we get to the cross, Satan's going to come on stronger and stronger and stronger. And so we got to stay focused. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let us never forget as this church grows and continues to grow, it's never been and never will be about us. It's always about Jesus Christ. Let's go to God in prayers. We ask him to, to uh, oh, one more thing. <laughs> it's always one more thing, right? We were going to have some more baptisms this morning. Larry and Peggy Trexler are ill, and so they could not be here today. So we'll be doing that as soon as we're able. And I think, um, is George still sick? I believe George, is Cindy sick or just George? Uh, they're, they're getting better. Okay, George, I don't know who's got to turn that heat but I'm going to be in my speedo if I was preaching right here. Holy <laughs> Moses. And, um, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 remember, somebody's That's a sight to see. Okay, so we want to, uh, remember George and see they're getting better. How about, I didn't see Mark yet. Nope, oh, there he is. He's still doing good, Mark. Perfect. And then Mark number two. Where's Mark? Behind me. You still got the mark? <laughs> I got Mark one, Mark two, and all these marks. I'm good. When do we get the heart monitor on? Uh, well, it's been off for a couple of days. Oh, you didn't tell me. I don't know. He told me he couldn't cut the work because I'm a heart monitor. He's melting it, right? Yeah. 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 And that's just heart monitor. Can't do that. April 1st, I get the ball. Okay, April 1st, full day, right? Yeah, okay, that's a good one. All right, well, let's go to God in prayer as we ask God to bless this service. Lord, we will pause for a moment. Just thank you so much for Jesus. Because we realize that. If it weren't for the gift of your son to come and die on the cross for our sins and we might have a way back to you, then all of this would just be, would be in vain and it would be no, for no purpose. But because of Jesus, because of your gift, because of his shed blood on the cross, we now have a way back to you. And Lord, we would ask that you put a special blessing over this church. Satan comes at us from all different angles and from all different perspectives sometimes even from within. And we pray that you would just continue to, to put your hand of protection around us and help us to stay focused on you. Help us to be humble. Help us to never think it's about us, but always about you. Lord, we pray for our music team. And we're so excited as, as they, they practice and they, they put so much effort and, and time into it to, to make it what it is. And we pray that you would be with, with, with each person that's up here this morning. Each person has a lot to contribute. But we pray that you'd be with them this morning that through song they can open hearts and eyes and, and help, help us to better see you and to serve you. <laughs> and Lord, we want to ask a special prayer also for our brother Abe this morning as Abe is going to bring the message and testimony from his heart. And Lord, we just know he's going to do a great job and we just ask that you would that you would Allow Abe to step aside and just let your Holy Spirit work through him and let his message be strong and allow it to be on point. We just thank you so much for Abe and for Kendra and for all they bring to the table and all that they're doing to help this church. Lord, we'd ask that you just bless everybody here. We pray that this service today is one that will give you praise and give you glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you. 
Oh yeah. Amen. 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 Thank you. 
Difference. A lot of us are taught at a very young age who Jesus is. So, for example, here I have a Bible. This Bible was given to me when I was four years old. You see how used that is? That was from my youth. When I was a child, I was taught to read this book every day. Amen. A couple times a day. And I did. Because I obeyed my parents. Bible here was given to me when I was turned 13 by my sister. You can see the difference between this Bible and this Bible. So there's a big difference between those years, right? Big difference. Somewhere along the way, I gave up on God. This Bible was given to me when I was 33 years old. Somewhere along the way, I picked up a Bible a little bit more. So, you know, plenty of people have probably grown up in a Christian home. We've, we've all had experiences with it. We look at our brothers and sisters and go, that guy's a hypocrite. They won't do this right and they follow the Lord. Well, the Bible says, to judge not that ye be not judged. God has a plan for you, whether it's from the day you were born to put this in your your head, and your mind, and your heart. We can go to the internet. There's, there's so many godless things on the internet. 
How many of you get on the internet and see hatred, evil? Amen. Everything under the sun is on the internet, right? You want to know what else is on the internet that you cannot miss? It's in Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, anything you get on. There's word of God there. And you can't tell me if you love the world here, you're not going to see God. That was a plan. The plan from Jesus that we know who he is. And it, and it doesn't matter how evil this world is. He's there and he puts you himself in your heart because that was his plan for you. God wants everyone here to be saved, right. to be a child of his. Because we are all created in his image. So I'm going to start sharing with you guys if you want some of my childhood. So I grew up on a horse ranch. So there wasn't a day that I walked this earth that I didn't know what a horse was, how to ride a horse. And in the same aspect, there wasn't a day I didn't know what a prayer was, what the Bible was. The big difference in the two and how you're talking. We have a lot of uh, people out there that we as humans, we look up to. It might be our parents, it might be a pastor, your wife, your husband, your dad. I had a pretty harsh dad. One that believed that he was following God's ways. He believed it very firmly. So firmly that he failed to look in the mirror. So so firmly he failed to think that he was he was not man, but he was probably God himself. And in doing so, he had children that believed God and they obeyed him. But did we really believe in God? I didn't. I was afraid of God. I was scared of God, because all I knew that came from God was evil. It was pain. It was hurt. At times, as a child, I can remember, as a three-year-old, my dad whipped me so bad that my skin fell off my body off my legs. That went on through most of my youth, probably till I was 15. He would to pants us in front of our family and whip us. And we'd have to hold our toes and keep our knees locked. The pain got so bad that when I was in third grade, most of my siblings, there was now five of us in public school. Most of us were being observed by our teachers. Um, and at one point, the school approached my father and said, if, you, if this abuse doesn't end with your children, we're gonna report you. So my dad pulled us out of public school. From third grade, I've never been educated. You don't get out of third grader. It's what I had. I can tell you this much, if I didn't have God watching over me, if God didn't have a plan for me, I wouldn't be the man who I am today. Amen. Today, I have no, no skills of my own. I'm a successful home builder. I do lots of other things that I would say I'm a success at, but the person who gave me that strength was God. I suppose God said, hey, if you're going to be dumb, you better be tough. Because <laughs> that's what I've had to be. Um, and anybody who knows the construction business knows it's a pretty ruthless business. There's a lot of ruthless people in that industry. There's a lot of great people in that industry. Um, but uh, I wouldn't be here because my first construction job, I didn't know how to read tape measure. And uh, I just prayed that I could, I could make it till I made it, and I did. And. Um, today, we build about eight to nine custom homes in the Bitterroot Valley every year. And every year it gets more and more. And that, that itself can only be a gift that God gave me with these two hands. Because my dad never had those skills. Um, no one ever taught me. I didn't get to go to Comac. I didn't have a wood class. So, I know that without God's strength and without his plan, I wouldn't have been there. The journey for me 
the long one because though I knew God as a child, I knew who he was, I didn't know, know him. I didn't know that God was love. I knew God was gonna punish me if I messed up. If I made a mistake, I knew I was going to hell. If I lied to my parents because I was a three-year-old and I said I brushed my teeth, but I didn't, it wasn't a lie, but I thought I was burning in hell. And I may as well have, because the burn marks on my legs felt like it. And that was where it started when I was a child. I would question God, I would pray to God. I would say, God, if you're real, why does this happen? If you are really real, why does this happen? Why do I have to see my sisters and my mom get beat? My brothers, my older brothers try to protect us. Why is that? Didn't have an answer. God never spoke to me. I would pray, I would cry, I would pray. We'd go to church, I'd cry, and I'd pray. Never said anything. Nothing changed at our home life. I'm going to read. This is going to be hard because I'm going to read a, a couple things of the letter that my mom, my one of my family members wrote to my parents. Just so you know, it's not all coming for me. Um, this starts out, and this is a day I can remember. I was probably three years old, four, because my oldest brother, there's about a year and a half apart all the way down. So my oldest brother is six years older than me. So bear with me because I'm sorry. <laughs> says, I'm going to expose my greatest hurts and hurdles in growing up, so please bear with me. I'm not passing judgment, only allowing you to see me in my vulnerability and understand why things are the way they are. Who knows, maybe this exposure can change things. I remember my sister around the age of five or six, finding mom and coming to get me after mom had attempted suicide. I remember going into that trailer house bathroom and seeing blood, a lot of blood. I remember running to the kitchen and grabbing towels. The image of seeing my mom's arms dripping with blood and wrapping those kitchen towels around her wounds. I remember the blood in the bathtub on the floor in the bathroom counters. My little sister sobbing uncontrollably, knowing I need to get help, but not knowing what to do or where to go. Didn't know who I should get. Should I get my dad? Should I call 911? I remember being very scared that my mom was going to die. If I didn't do something, it's going to be my fault. I do not remember who got help or how it came. That memory stops with fear. An image seared in my mind, haunts me for years, thinking that memory faded, only for it to come popping up at the worst moments. I can only imagine how that has affected my sister since she was the first one to find you that day. Those one couple more things that she talks about, talks about all the times that, that my dad got mad, threw a fit, put us in a car, took us to a gravel pit, spent the night, different times where we went to a gravel pit, found our dad lying in a gravel pit with a pistol to his head, pretending to commit suicide. Lots of, lots of things in there. 
and those are just emotional things, not just physical pain. It goes on to a night where I can remember this night vividly. It was a day that we usually hoped for because our dad was painful. We wanted him gone. I have children, a son, a daughter. I couldn't imagine coming home with those kids running to the farthest corner of my property so they didn't have to see me. That's what I did every day. Every day my dad came home, I went to the farthest corner of our property and ran. And that's what I did with God most of my life. And I'll get to that point, I'll get to it soon enough, how I ran from him. But there was, a, there was a day when I couldn't run from him no more. This, this is stuff that has to be said, because if it isn't said, I'm burying a lot of stuff. I'm burying a lot of stuff. And part of the, part of my journey of being able to accept God is being able to let this out, being able to tell the truth about what went on with me, because if I didn't, I'd be bitter inside. I'd have anger inside, and I'd walk with that, and I'd take my family, and I'd raise it the same way my father did, and I'm not going to do that. Amen. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to let the devil stop me from being a godly man, because he did. He did for years. So one day, I can remember this day vividly. My sister writes about it, and it's going to tell, tell the story of how most of us So, she says, she felt like God forsake her. She felt like God forsake her. This was a night where my older brothers had moved out of home. They were working construction. They came home for Father's Day. And for whatever reason, my, my dad threw a fit on every holiday, Valentine's Day, his birthday. My birthday, my sister's birthday. It was all about him. Life was about my father. If you didn't do what he asked you to the right way, it was, you You were in for it. And I mean, not in a good way. I've seen my dad break a horse of glass over one of my older brother's heads for no fault of their own. And I don't know how many of you, you guys are cowboys, you should know what a horse of scraps looks like. About that long, somewhere in there, about that wide, hard and steel, got a grasping edge to file their hooks down. Anybody here want to get back inside the head of the pool? I don't think so. And my dad broke one over my brother's head. Just like that, he could drop dead. Never phased my dad, never phased him one bit, because I don't think he truly cared about his children's life. I think he cared. What he cared about was he read this book and he read one verse in there and it said, spare the rod, spoil the child. And it never even, never even dawned on him to think that that rod may not be a stick. The Bible says in Psalms 23, thy rod and thy staff they come from Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. My rod and my staff, they come to me. Now think about that. What's a rod and a staff? The staffs were grabbing sheep. They hooked them. Or, um, yeah, and a rod was a walking stick. It guided them on their paths so they didn't strip. Trip and stumble. The rod isn't necessarily there to be your kids. It's a guiding. You should be a guiding example to your children and who they should be. You fail to do that, yeah, they will stray from it. So my sister says she remembers a night where my father got into it when my brothers came home. I'm sorry if I'm bouncing around. This is all new to me. And I'm a third grader, you gotta remember that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my two older brothers were no longer living at home, so the big responsibility landed on me because I was the oldest son living at home. I was 
probably 12 or 13 at the time, maybe a little bit older. I stayed in the basement of the house with my younger brother, who was four years younger than me. We all lived in an unfinished basement. We had a rickety log cabin that was half finished. My grandpa sent my dad money to do, and all he could do was buy horses. We had so many horses, I hated horses. I broke so many horses, I can't stand horses. Today, I, I have horses, and I enjoy those horses. But there was a time where I didn't want to see one of those ever again, ever again. And uh, my brothers brought my dad a gift that he didn't like. So we had to buy him a gift, even though he took all our money. Well, even though he hired us out to farmers and ranchers and took our money to find us. They bought him something and he didn't, he didn't feel it was worthy enough. You know, my daughter will bring me a cut up postcard and I think it's amazing. <laughs> She'll bring me a booger half the time. <laughs> I don't need it, but I go thank you. You know, it's love. Either way, it's love, and I enjoy that love. Um, but, but, but this this set my dad off, and for whatever reason, my brother said, "We're done. We're not coming home no more. We're not coming here. We're done." They left, <laughs> left for good. My brother. Said, my oldest brother, he had uh, some stuff and when he worked road construction, when he'd come home, he'd stay at our house. He didn't have a place. He'd come stay home. But that was the day he was gone. He said, I'm, I'm out of here. I'll never come home again. Many of us felt that way from the time our little kids, little children. This night, that set my dad off. He blamed my mother for it. It's all her fault. She was a rebellious woman. She wasn't adhering to the word of God. Probably a reason for that. It wasn't my mom's fault, but my mom took the blame, so it became her fault. Us children blamed her too, because she never stood up for us. What can you do? You're not going to have a mother that doesn't protect her children, and her children sit there and not look at her like it's your fault. Because as, as a kid, you know you could do something. If I could stand there and take a beating for you, mom. You could at least tell the sheriff the truth. This night, my dad pulled out a 30 30. We had all kinds of guns in our house. They were always loaded 90% of the time. I don't know who doesn't have a gun that's not loaded. He was so mad. His lesson was always he's either going to kill you or himself. Once he got to the point where he was exhausted from beating us, that's what he would do. He was broke down and physically exhausted, he could no longer punish us. Then it was, I'm gonna kill myself. Pulled out the 30-30 and I was in the basement. And my sisters at this point, and my little brother, we were sent to bed and he's still arguing with my mom, screaming, yelling, telling her he's gonna teach her a lesson, he's gonna kill himself. I remember, at this point, I'd started to develop a defiance for my dad and his anger because Along the way, when I was 13 years old on a hunting trip, my dad put a loaded gun in my back. 280, I don't know if you guys know what that is, but it's a round. It's a little kind of a cross mix, 7mm, 30 out of 6. He put that loaded gun in my back while I'm saddling. I saddled up his horse, and I'm still saddling up mine. And this is in the morning because he told me to turn off the alarm clock and he slept longer than he wanted to. I couldn't do nothing about it because I was on the inside of the camper bunk. He was in front of me. I couldn't get out of bed. As, I'm, as, as he got up, he was mad. He was fuming mad because someone was blasting off around when he thought they got into help and we didn't do that. And that was my fault somehow. So I saddled up my dad's horse because my dad was too lazy to do anything for him to help. He never did anything for himself. You had to do it. You did it, you did it, you did it. Not him. He took no responsibility in life, and he still does it. And I'm not here to blame him. Criticize him. This is just the truth. I still love the man. He's my father. The Bible commands me to love him. The Bible commands you to bless your enemies. 
Bless those who persecute you. Curse not them. Curse them not. So, as I'm saddling up my horse, I feel the cold barrel of a gun go in the middle of my spine. Right there. Still feel it to this day. I've had many nightmares about that day, but it scared me. Because I had a two-year-old horse, that's what I got to ride. We got to ride green horses everywhere we went. Everywhere we went, because that's what we did. We busted the Bronx for my dad. It wouldn't matter if it was hunting season, the team broken. It didn't matter what it was, we were busting Bronx. And that horse was green, but I, it was a horse I had a connection with. And thank God I had that connection. Because she didn't spook, even though I knew I felt her, her tense up. She went just like I did. When that barrel went, she went. Could have been a horse my dad was on. I know it would have freaked out. I'd be a dead kid. Because there's no way you can control your finger and it's on a, a trigger and something backs in you. And as careless as my dad was with guns, knives, whatever, it's a wonder any of us made it by one. This guy, that I call my dad, he's my earthly dad. There's nothing I can do about our relationship because it's on him. All I've done, everything I can, I've forgiven him, tried to talk to him, tried to change him. It's not going to change. So all I could do is look to my heavenly father. That day, when that, that gun went in my back, it changed me. I no longer felt I had to respect my father. I no longer felt that I was honoring my father by letting him put us down. Started standing up for myself, my siblings. Started not caring if my dad was all right or not. Didn't care. So that night when he walked out and he was still arguing with my mom and my sisters were upstairs. And, and mind you, they were upstairs in an attic. We had a three-story house. Tell me the roof floors, inch and a half floor on the second floor, inch and a half floor on the attic floor, thick, thick floors. My dad was in the basement arguing with my mom. And I stepped out of the room and told my little brother, stay here, I'm gonna watch him shoot himself. So I crawled up on the stairs. Because at this point, I think I wouldn't be wrong to say probably every one of my siblings wanted him dead. That's not a good thing. It's, it's a horrible thing. But it's what we felt. It's the pain, the hurt. So I'm watching him. But he doesn't know I'm on the stairs looking down on him. And he pulls out the gun. And I remember to this day, he puts it up here like this. And I'm like, okay, cool. It's under your, it's, it's there. Pull that trigger. But the coward that he really was, he pulled it away, shot it through the floor. It went this far from where my sister, my sister was kneeling on her knees, praying to God stop this. It went that far from her. She'd be a dead person if she had to. God hadn't told her you're done with your prayer to get in bed. She finished her prayer, got in bed, and it went that far from where she was, she was just kneeling and praying right there at her bed, and she got in her bed and went that far from her bed. God had a plan for her. He had a plan for her to come, go on and become the great person she is today. And I'm not going to tell you, say what she does, because she would rather not be picked out in case my parents see the message, um, which I doubt they will. But... <laughs> She went on to be, become a, a, a great woman. She uh, shares her love for Christ. She helps heal people. That's an amazing thing, coming from pain. God had a plan for her to be something that took pain from people. My other sister does the same thing. It's all part of God's plan. But she said, here, day, that day that that bullet went by me and I prayed and I prayed, that's the day I felt like God forsake me. My, my journey is not the same as her. I felt since I was a little kid 
God forsake me. Most of my older siblings all accepted the Lord and got baptized by the time they were 12 years old. Um, I did. My parents, the church, prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for me. You're going to hell. You don't speak tongues. You don't have the Holy Ghost. I didn't know. All I did was I didn't want to go to that heaven and be with that God that distributed that pain. Always, I always prayed to God. I always knew God was there. I never accepted Him. I rejected Him because God, to me, I'd rather burn in hell than have the same pain that I felt on earth. Come a uh, some point in my life, uh, I was about 16 years old. My father decided that on a day that was supposed to be a celebration for my sister, we needed to cash rate colts. Any of you know what it takes to cash rate a colt by hand? It's 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 a job, especially a yearly colt. And if they're a good built court horse, it's a real job. So me and my sister were tasked with that duty, which meant we haltered him, we two up, tied up a rear leg, and we turned it in a circle until it fell over. And then we wrestled it, tied it up, and then we did the job. Well, my sister forgot the emasculators, anybody? <laughs> Crimp the cord so they don't bleed to death when you're done with them. That, that sent my dad into a rage. Instead of driving 10 miles home, instead of turning around five miles in, he decided he'll be in a rage all the 10 miles to the pasture. When my sister got out. He proceeded to get even madder while we were on the way. He started being her and kicking around the butt. I, don't, I couldn't tell you how many times I've had a broken tailbone. Not because I got stepped on by something, because my dad put a steel toe boot in my butt so damn deep that it broke my tailbone. My sisters, too, they live with scar tissue, and I probably do, too, too. They've had x rays, they live with scar tissue in their back that is only from severe beatings as a child. So that day, I had enough. I had enough because God was working in me, He was working in me. Whether people think it's okay or not, he was working with me. Because God knows, at some point, I'm going to stop the devil's work. He's going to stop what harms me. That day, God gave me strength to beat my dad up. I'm not proud of it. I did what I had to do to protect my sister. In the process of doing so, for the hundredth time, my dad kicked me out. I was done. I was on my own. 16. I won't get into details. I guess prior to that, my dad tried to castrate me. Looked at me, told me I should never be a father. Too worthless and dumb to be a father. I shouldn't have children. Took his pocket knife out, had me on the ground, was taking my pants off, and he was going to castrate me. How pretty such a feeling being a young man. Having love in your heart, because I always, I always love children. I love children. They're, they're the best thing on earth. I love baby animals. I love them. We, we dealt with enough of them, watched enough of them die. The innocence is an innocent. When a baby colt is born, you can imprint it, because it's never seen sin, it's never seen danger. It's the best time to imprint them, because they've never been exposed to this world. We as children are the same one. It's not until we start moving on in that path where we get jaded. We look at others, and that's why the Bible says that we should judge others. Because when we do, we ruin ourselves. We damage ourselves. We, we, we create bitterness in our heart. We're looking at someone going, oh, they, I can't believe they did that. And you're, what, what's happening? What's happening? You're getting angry. You're getting rage. And that bitterness won't allow you to move on. It won't allow you to deal with what you're doing because you're too focused on someone else's sin that you cannot accept what is in front of you. That day, 
It was the day that it was done for me. And that day, this third grader right here made it on his own. There were some hard times, some hard times. I went and lived with my brother. It was uh, running a nine mile ranch at the time. And about a week into that, the sheriff knocked on the door. So if that boy doesn't go home, you're gonna get charges pressed on you. We didn't know what to do. We told him we ain't going home. But that my brother said that my, my brother's not going home. He may not be here, but he ain't going home. We went into town the following week. I got an attorney that agreed to represent me to get emancipated from my parents. We didn't know what to do. Before that, we went and talked to some Christian friends, tried to reason with my dad, and all came to a conclusion that if someone went home, someone was gonna die. Not long after, my dad had scared every sibling of mine but one to testify against me in court. But I was a rebel child, just wanting to go out and live the ways of the world that I couldn't, couldn't handle being corrected. Being corrected would have been one thing, but I couldn't handle seeing my mom beat, my sister beat, my little brother beat. I had 162 stitches in my chin from my dad running me over with a pickup truck because I stepped up for my little brother. I don't think I was trying to be rebellious. I think I was trying to do what I was told to do by God, which was stick up for my family. So I got an attorney. She represented me. She represented me for free. Though my siblings tried to do what they thought was right, they failed my dad that day. Because one thing they were taught not to do was lie. And they could not lie, and they were cross examined. They told the truth. My sister was forced to sit here, and I don't know how hurtful that was for her. Yeah, I watched my dad try to castrate my brother. Yeah, I've seen my dad try to kill every one of his kids in one way or another. I'm sure that was painful for them because they were torn between what they thought they were doing, which was honoring their father and telling the truth. Because what they were taught was if you went against your father or your mother in any way, shape, or form, you were not honoring them. And we were taught in the Bible to honor our father and mother. Yes, we are. But it also says, Father, provoke not the children to anger. There's a verse in Romans 8.28 that ties together with my emancipation. And it wasn't a plan for anything I knew at the time because... As you can see, I stopped reading that. I stopped opening this book. Okay, so I, I was unaware of God's plan in my life. This says, and we know, Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good, for those are call, who are called according to his purpose. God had a purpose for a plan. I'd later go on to find a trailer house with a guy that I picked rocks and cleaned up his property for, but I didn't have money to eat the place, so I got a dog named the Boots. It was Border Collie Lab. The dog kept me warm. The dog ate tofu turkey with me. Was it one I could afford? <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I ain't buying that stuff again. <laughs> Not good stuff. Gross. Eventually, I got a job at a car wash. The Y, the truck stop. And I got by. I made enough money to pay my gas money. Made enough money to get to work. Made enough money to save a dollar, but not enough money to be good yet. Until one day, a truck rolled in, and there was about four of them. There two of us. That was my only jet. She wanted her two of us and her truck's detail before a concert. I got passed with that job. 
she was so impressed with the work I did, and I was even really bad. She gave me a $150 tip. That tip inspired me. It wasn't that I wasn't already taught to do everything to the best of my knowledge. Don't ever do anything half witty, whatever you want to say. <laughs> this is church, so I'm not going to say, say the other part. Don't ever do anything halfway. <coughs> well, it was never worried to be like that. It was, it was, it was what you know. <sighs> but it inspired me because that was the only day in my life I was actually rewarded for my hard work. And it inspired me. It inspired me to put everything into what I did because I would get rewarded for it. I didn't know that until that day. And that is how I have spent the rest of my life when I work. I work with everything I have, the best that I can for everyone. And God has blessed me for it. God has given me the strength to do that. I guess my point to that is, is that we may not always know a lot of us come from different backgrounds. A lot of us have a hard time healing. A lot of us have a hard time talking about that. Well, there's a little spit spat with our parents. For those of you who have a really good relationship with your parents, it don't take much to hurt your feelings, does it? You've got to walk away from that and forgive them. You've got to walk away from that and bless them. When you feel it's hurting you, you must bless them. Because that's how you bless yourself. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to be blessed. It says in Jeremiah, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. If we don't forgive, we can't seek God. We can't. Because we're so consumed in our own feelings, we're not thinking about Him. We're not thinking about God's will. We're just thinking about how do we get revenge on that person. Or, boy, God's got some pain in store for him. Actually, he does. Because in the Bible verse, the one I just read, read you, I think it's Ephesians 4 32. It says, when it says, it says, bless them that curse you. And it says, for he will reap heaps of coal upon their head. That is, that is, when you seek to God, he will get the revenge for you. You don't got to worry about it. Because one day, we're all going to be caught up there. He's going to look at every single one of us and examine our lives. So, do you want him sitting there going, Brother Mark, all you did was judge others. All you did, and I'm not saying that, all you did was revolve your life around bitterness and hating somebody else. Or you want them to go, well done, that good and faithful servant. You loved them, but you loved unconditionally. You didn't, you didn't recurse upon those who cursed you. You blessed them. Great will be your reward. You will have a much better reward when you can forgive those who hurt you. When you can bless those who persecute you. I guess my message today is if you have pain, you have hurt, you have things from your past that are holding you back from God, don't let it, don't wait all those years because I was the third monkey on the wheel, <laughs> knocking on the door to the ark for a long time. I strayed away from God and I stayed away from getting baptized my entire childhood. My parents wanted baptized. No, they, they knew I don't want nothing. 
I don't want your God. I can tell you this much, I didn't want their God because their God isn't the same God as mine because I serve a Savior that loves every one of us unconditionally. And, he, and in his, his word, right here says he doesn't, he doesn't, he has, he has plans for you to give you hope in that future. Nowhere in the Bible do I read that Jesus came to this earth to pain people. He came here to save us, every one of us. He gave his life on the cross shed his blood so we could have eternal life, salvation. That's a great, great gift. Yeah. My entire life, I didn't know that. So I strayed away from that God. I strayed away from the God that I knew, which wasn't the God of love. So one day, I was driving. And my life's been a story of ups and downs. <laughs> Like I said, God said, if you're going to be tough, you better be tough, boy. Because I had a really good run in the construction industry until about 2010. It slowed down for me. So a change of plans came for me. My plan was I'd go to Alaska. I'd work on a drilling rig for gold. The day before I was supposed to fly out, I went up in the woods with a friend. Just coming home on a four wheeler nice and slow. What do you know? Broke my leg. Clean in half. Snapped it between a tree and a tire of the four wheeler. Me, being the tough kid that I was taught to be, goes, I think it broke my leg. My buddy goes, What happened to you? He said, I think it broke my leg. But I was so in need, I couldn't afford to break my leg. So I told myself, I said, I don't have a broken leg, I don't have a broken leg. I'm pulling on it, and it's going like this, and I'm like, I said, you can't be broken. You can talk yourself into something that you, I mean, I, I literally talked myself into this leg ain't broken, I just smacked it. So I got off the four-wheeler, threw it on the ground, down to the side of it. Yep, it's broken. Back on the four wheeler, 21 miles out, seven miles an hour. All the jars and I'm holding it every time we hit a bump. My buddy's like, You should have You should call an ambulance. I think they'll be just as bumpy in the ambulance because there's a long ways up here. Let's get back to the truck and go to the hospital. So three hours later, we get back to the truck. Coaxing my buddy who fainted a couple of times because he couldn't handle the pain. I'm going, come on, let's get home. Get to the hospital. I'm walking in. I think I got a broken leg. Hmm. Yep, looks like it. We got an x-ray. There they do. I says, can I get some ibuprofen for the pain? I don't deal. No, no, you're going to surgery. We don't do that. Okay, okay. Well, they put four rods in a pin and left me with my whole plans because I was supposed to fly out the next morning to Alaska. The job I needed. I needed that job. I didn't have it. So now I was faced with a $40,000 doctor bill. That's real pleasant when you're broke. <laughs> so I didn't know what to do. So I had a backup plan. I called another company because the other company was like, well, we got to find someone in place. So I called another company. I drove to Spokane. So as soon as you're better, we'll hire you. Okay. So I've got to do physical therapy. My bum butt's up there two and a half weeks later trying to hike the hem, thinking that I'm healed, because they don't give you. When they put a rod and pins in your legs, when it's this low and they're the they don't put a cast on it. They give you some crutches. And if you're stupid, you'll walk on it. That's what I did. So I got a lump on my leg because Five weeks later, I was up in Alaska doing 13 hour day on broken leg. It didn't last too long, so I didn't like being gone. It lasted about a year, and I started working road construction, working on a heavy equipment crew, being a mechanic and a boiler. I travel all the way. We get a lot of jobs. Well, Eastern Montana, Culbertson, to be precise, one of them. You've been there, that's, that's hell. It's an ugly place. <laughs> um, 
When I was coming home, we were moving a job, and I used to do a cross shift because I had a mechanic I worked with a day, half the day, and then I covered the night shift. So I worked the night shift, and then we were wrapping up a job, and I needed to come home with my camper trailer, so I needed to move to Martinsdale on him with my camper trailer. It was a long drive. For some reason, my pickup was acting up, so I don't drive off in no more. It was a dodge. And I had to dodge every pothole in the road to keep the front end in the road. That's one thing I did. And I was pulling over, side of the road, taking oil for something was wrong with it. Me and the I mechanic until two in the morning. I didn't have time to mechanic on that thing. I have to keep throughout the filter and I go another hundred miles and then I could something something was wrong. I wouldn't get enough fuel, the fuel pump was going bad, getting that on it, plugging up my fuel filter, whatever it was. So by the time I get to Martinsdale, I'm more out. It's ten some at night. I fuel up, get back on the road. And anybody's ever come through Martinsdale through towns that you know that road pretty narrow. I come through there in the middle of that canyon. Doing about 65 miles an hour. And there's no shoulder. It's it's worse than the east side highway over here. Right about there's a bend and there's a pond. I remember seeing the pond and I'm going by the pond and it has a bend coming around, it's a rock ball. I hit that rock wall head on. Head on. No seatbelt, no brakes. My truck hit that so hard. I remember. All I remember is just seeing these branches and rocks. And I don't know what it was. Maybe the years that I rode, rode bronc, broke horses, bull rode, I don't know what it was, but I had grabbed that jump seat right here. And it held on for dear life. I think that was God, because I couldn't act that quick. That truck hit and it went end over end and then rolled three times on the side, back into the middle of the road. I'm sitting in there, I can hear it running. As long as the dog, it still ran. It's the only good thing. It was running, and I, I gotta shut it off. I thought I was on my wheels. I was so. I thought I was sitting on the wheels. So I, I'm like, I gotta put this in here. <laughs> yeah. Nothing's nothing's happened. Well I realized I was upside down. On the side. I was on I was sitting on the driver's side. It was on the ground. So like this. Driver's side was on the ground, passenger door was here, and I'm like, I gotta get out of this thing. So I grabbed the door. <laughs> falls down. Falls down. I'm trying to crawl out of it. Anybody knows that road, it's a pretty slow road in October 11th. It's hunting season, so it's not even up to an antelope opening day. I was really on that road. So I get out of my truck, I finally got my way out of the truck. At this point, I thought I was great. So I'm like, well, I just gotta get out of the road. Tried to push it over, I couldn't do that. That gave me the strength to drive the accident, not to get the truck off the road, and that's about it. So, there's no cell phone service. I knew the area, and I thought, well, it comes and goes, so if I get up on one of these hills, I'll have cell phone service. So I started hiking away from the truck in the hills. Then I got to thinking, man, I'm, I'm in big trouble. I'm, I'm gonna go to jail. I left a car in the road, amongst other things. So I said, I'm just gonna keep hiking. They say I hiked about 14 miles from the accident to where they pinned me on my cell phone. Well, I had nothing but a t-shirt, cowboy boots, I walked through a creek. This is October 11th. Uh, I walked till 6 in the morning, from 10 in the morning with nothing on. I had, at one point, I laid down, they had search and rescue out there looking for me, because I, at a certain point I got disoriented. This is dark out and there's a lot of trees. I, Eventually, my goal was to hike up and hike back down in Townsend. Well, I finally got cell phone service in there somewhere, and I got a hold of 911. They said, Where are you at? We're looking for you. I said, I'm not here in the mountains. Come get me. I said, Well, stay put. We're going to ping you. 
They ping me. They couldn't find me. We're honking our horns. Can you hear our horn? No. Can you see our lights? I can't see nothing. Stay put. I said, I can't stay put. I'm freezing to death. My, my boots are wet. I walked through a creek. I'm freezing. I got to keep moving. One point, I laid down on a big spruce. And it was the only heat I could get because it was ground heat. It was the best to warm me up. I started walking down where I saw a light. I walked to that light. I came to my guy's house at about 6 a.m. Pounded on the door. He's sitting there drinking his coffee. Walks up to the door. Uh, you stay right there. Okay. Uh, I did, you know, I'm bloody. I'm, I'm bloody. I'm bruised. I look like a rat. He says, What's, what are you doing? He thought I must have been a drug addict or something, you know. So that I got an accident. Police are looking for me. I just, I just thought, can, can you call him? Because by the time I got back to his house, there was no service. So he said, I'm going to call him. He calls him and confirms him. <coughs> yeah, we were looking for him. We don't lock him up. <laughs> they get there, they bring an the ambulance there because they, they, they brought an ambulance. They had an ambulance. They had an ambulance sitting because they thought I was dead. First, they thought I was dead underneath the truck when they moved out and I wasn't there. They were like, this is going to go for this. So, the ambulance came. They looked at me and go, You got to have hypothermia. I was like, No, I'm good. Okay. I can, like, get in our. I can like, walk over here. I'm like, No, 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 no. You're way too disoriented, messed up. We gotta put me in this bed, trap you out. So they put me on a gurney, trap you out, put me in the ambulance. I'm like, I could have walked in here, like, no way you can. I could. We show you. <laughs> but then they put me in the hypothermia blanket, you know, that airs up and it blows stuff through the tubes. Pull away. They race it. They whip out of there, the sheriff's falling on one in front of them, behind them, and they're just flying to the hospital. I'm going, I'm fine, slow down, you don't need to go to the hospital. No, you're not. I got a guy sitting here poking me. I'm like, why are you poking me? They're taking blood samples, do a urine test, all that above, because I had to have been out of my mind, right? Well, he's poking me, and I'm like, why are you poking at me? Why are you touching me? He goes, because there's something wrong with you. You're a miracle. And I go, what do you mean? I said, the spot where you at? Two kids last week died there. And your truck is worse than theirs. You should be dead. And I go, well, I'm here. I'm right here. And uh, they held me in that hospital, did a bunch of tests, actually, I had hit so hard in that pickup that my lungs tore from my back. So I was building fluid in my lungs. I didn't know it. I was I thought I was strong. Tough guy. Um, they're going, oh you're wheezing, you can you have a hard time breathing, you need to send your billings. You're not sending me anywhere. So I told them, I'm gonna stay right here, I'm gonna go home today. And I did. I went home that day. They didn't like it. They barely released me. They wanna take me to guns. I've never been back to a hospital since that day. Well, I can tell you, it's God had his hand on me that day. He had a plan for me to be here today to share a message with you. To share with you that no matter where we're at in life, whether we believe in God or not, because we're offended by someone, we're giving up on God, right? I've given up on God. God made me hit that wall, and he put me through that. Because that's the day that I started putting my focus back on him. It didn't happen overnight. It was a long journey. From that, that was 2012 to the day that I finally opened up my heart and said, God, I want to serve you. It was 2015. But that was the day that, that opened up my eyes and said, You've got to change. God's not going to keep you here forever. It was a slow change because I had a lot of healing to do. A lot of things to put behind me before I could open up to God. And I believe that was God's plan because God had a plan to mold me into a completed set of plans. 
here today sharing that with you. And if any of you are struggling with those same things, let it go to God. Let it go to Jesus. He's the only one that's going to heal you. You're not going to do it by your own strength. You walk around this world aimlessly, wondering what your plan is. And you never see it because you don't open up this book. Because in this book, this is the Bible I had from a child, but I never understood it. This book lays out everything, everything that you can imagine. God's plan, God's word, your salvation, and your eternal life is in this book. Every bit of it. I think, go ahead, Steve. And I, I, I thanks, thank you everybody for listening. I'm sorry about this stuff. It's like a fish tailing horse trailer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hopefully everybody got the message. Um, I'm here today to, you know, I am here. I, I forgive my father. And I, you know, uh, two years ago my grandfather died. And uh, my grandfather was a pretty good man as far as blessing people with things. He always blessed my dad with monetary things. I don't know how he was. It really is a personal thing. My grandfather died when I left an inheritance, he had a will. The inheritance was that his grandchildren would get 2% of the value of him before my father and his sister. Means that my dad was my grandfather's only son and he was a baby child. He made him the executor of the will. Grandfather had a trust. Trust supersedes the will. Guess what my dad did? Looking at it, going, oh, man, you know, I don't need that money. I hope it blesses you. I hope it blesses you because it's all you're going to be left with. And if it helps you, it helps me. So, as we go about our lives, I encourage every one of you. When someone offends you, whether it's a family member, whether it's a co-worker, maybe me, forgive them, bless them, because when you do so, it will free your soul. Thanks, everybody. Just invite anybody to come up and pray if they need prayer. It's, it's open.
that you're walking a similar path to what Abe did. But if you listen to what Abe said, Abe never lost focus. We're blessed that you and your family are here. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for Abe. Well, thank you for the life that he lived. We pray he never has to relive any part of it again. We, we know, we know from knowing what we know of Abe and being able to be around him. I'm honored to call him my brother. And the example that he sets for all of us. And the love that he has for his family, for his children, for his son, for his daughter, for his son yet to be, is also an example that he sets for each one of us here at this church. We're honored that Abe and Kendra have, have found their way to High Country Cowboy Church. We're so blessed by Abe's life. We're so blessed and honored to be able to have him serve as youth pastor of this church. Lord, we would ask that you would continue to watch over all of us and to bless us. And there may be people here this morning, Lord, that may be feeling like, man, I'm all alone and nobody can really understand what I'm going through. Well, that's probably what Abe thought at times as well. But Lord, I'm here to tell you and here to encourage others that it will just if we'll just look to you, if we'll just focus our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, we thank you so much for this church and, and for the dynamics of this church and how each person here is a family member. We laugh together, pray together, cry together, rejoice together. Today, we rejoice with Abe in the message that he shared in the journey that you took him through to make him the man that he is and a great man that he is for sure. We thank you for Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's, there's coffee. There's snacks. If you haven't yet hugged on Abe or hugged on a neighbor, do so. Woo! Thank you. 
Now this train is my glory, this train 